it's also important to be cautious about the way you program that code. Because even if you believe that you've programmed the code in a certain way, it might be exploitable by others because you haven't thought of all the implications of that code. Welcome to Hedera Hashgraphs, Gossip About Gossip. I'm Daniel Francis. I'm Ken Anderson. And I'm Paul Madsen. If you are a developer, an entrepreneur, crypto enthusiast, or just trying to learn more about how distributed ledger technology and Hedera Hashgraph will impact your industry, then you'll love the episodes that we have coming up. Bookmark us, add us to your podcast app, and stay tuned. Hi there, and welcome to Hedera Hashgraph Gossip About Gossip. I'm Paul Madsen. My guest today is one of Hedera's earliest ambassadors, Ali Pasha Farugi. Hi, Ali. How are you? Hi, Paul. Thanks. I'm fine. What does an ambassador do? I see you speculate on Telegram about council members. What else does an ambassador do? So, uh, first of all, an ambassador tries to understand what Hashgraph consensus algorithm is about, what the Hedera platform does provide. And then with, uh, in a mix of experience with other platforms and people who might be interested in the DLT technologies, we do spread the word. We try to explain, we do comparisons for people to understand not only what Hedera does differently, but also what actually the whole ecosystem of uh, distributed ledger technologies do. So we do workshops, we have meetups going on, we try to keep up all the time, and it's, it's a continuous conversation. I am here in Frankfurt, Germany, and I'm also traveling around in the region, and I'm practically, <laughs> whether or not Hedera likes that, I'm the face of the Hedera League in a local area. I've heard no complaints from the team about your face, so Thank you. keep doing what you're doing. How, how did you first hear about, I guess it would have been Hashgraph first, then Hedera? Yeah, so a couple of years ago, I was working with a startup on identity management stuff. While I was working there as an architect, I uh, was trying to understand the different consensus protocols and platforms, and our requirements were in a way, they demanded a lot of performance, okay? I just happened to find the Hashgraph white paper, and I was fascinated by the clarity of that white paper, but also because I used to be a math nerd, I was pretty much uh, falling in love with, with the beauty of that algorithm. So it started there, and then I just tried that out to everyone I knew and said, hey, I think we have a solution here. I think we have a solution here. And started right there, and then people tr uh, came back, of course, to me and thought, okay, that's just his consensus algorithm. There should be also a platform around that. And from there, it started going through all the obstacles or challenges or differences between the different platforms. And that's how it's up. Great. So like myself, before DLTs and Hashgraph, you were involved in identity management. I think that begs a, another chat in the future where we, we can talk about self-sovereign identity and decentralized identity and et cetera, and, and how Hedera might fit there, but for, for another day. <laughs> yeah. So Ali, I was, I was reading your, your Twitter stream and I saw a recent post where a couple, I think it was in Australia, had just gotten married the groom took a picture of their marriage license and uploaded it to the Bitcoin chain, you know, citing love is forever. And, you know, this is a testament to our commitment to each other, I guess. And you retweeted that and you wished them well, you wished them luck, but cited divorce statistics and possible ramifications of a penned only ledger with respect to that marriage license. So that's my somewhat awkward segue <laughs> into a discussion of immutability in the Bitcoin hard sense, particularly as it relates to smart contracts, right? And, and the implications of, 
of immutability for smart contracts. So my question, is code law and is that appropriate? So nice that you brought up that Twitter um, message. First of all, I, I just recently came back from a wedding of one of my best friends. And of course, people who make that kind of a decision, they better have that complete commitment and love for eternal, not only love, but also living together, right? So if, if you're basically not planning to have that kind of eternity, maybe you shouldn't get married. So from that perspective, of course, every piece of every cell in your body believes in that going to be forever. At the same time, we do know the rates of divorce are somewhere around 50%. And they actually do rise because people have more choices in life. So while understanding that we take a commitment, especially with smart contracts, to have an agreement which everybody is going to understand and accept, things happen. And saying that code is law means that that commitment would be the only thing that counts. But as in life, at the same as with code, there are circumstances that make that difficult. And let's now take the approach and go deeper into what's specific about code that makes that change necessary sometimes. What are the things that might happen to code? Okay, everyone who starts programming does not start with smart contracts. They start with simple programs and they understand simple arithmetic operations, and they, they build on that, they add input and output. So we are conditioned to use this special feature of code to be adaptable, to be changeable, to grow. And this is something that is actually beautiful in software, which is not always necessarily the case with hardware. So code is something that brings this benefit of being changeable. And when you start telling people you are not able to change that, you're actually working against the programmers. So the programmers need to understand that usually smart contracts aren't going to be changed, but that also means that they aren't able to work incrementally. They need to think about a lot of stuff beforehand. So that's already a challenge. But isn't that the case for normal software development? The devs work incrementally and iteratively, as you describe, but, but at some point they've got a version that they're confident in and they release that. Yes, that's true, but they do release very often. So if you take, for example, a website like Amazon.com, I believe the software changes even within minutes constantly, right? So... Even if you don't perceive that from outside, the ability to changing is actually very necessary in the usual cases. So it's contrary to the nature of code to not be changeable. But let's say we do understand now that a specific kind of agreement about conditions over requests for tokens are going to be a state machine that is well-organized and well-defined and it's not going to change. Okay, got that. But at the same time, there is a context around that, right? Because the code by itself, it's not as interesting as it is that people around that code are going to have interactions with the code. So there is already an interface with the code. And if you have a human interaction with software, it means that social constraints are going to build on top of that. Okay. One of that is, of course, that the cases that uh, we have different perceptions over time about privacy, right? So if you believe that you've done the right thing by programming a software with certain understanding of that, and then the law changes, as it did last year in Europe with GDPR, right? So it is necessary to change that code also at that case. Right, not just privacy, but in general, anything, right? The, the world can change, markets can change, 
Exactly. So, so the, the context around the code changes. And even if you don't change the source code of your code, just because the context has changed, the meaning of that code, when you run that code, has already implicitly changed and may not even be the same thing everyone agreed upon in the first place. So we need to have that understanding. I do get that it's very important to not easily change the code or sometimes don't even do that and say it's an immutable code for a certain amount of time. It does exactly something. In that case, it's also important to be cautious about the way you program that code. Because even if you believe that you've programmed the code in a certain way, it might be exploitable by others because you haven't thought of all the implications of that code, right? So in that case also, there will be bugs that need to be fixed or the code should be trashed and you need to start something new all over again. Indeed, and no discussion of bugs and smart contracts is complete without a mention of the, the DAO, right? And the, the consequences of, of those bugs. Yeah, I think that's very important that people understand more about DAO and what happened there. It's actually a great example of Cody's law. DAO is, stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And it was an idea, what if you could have a venture capital fund that is all about code that goes beyond borders, regulations, and some intermediaries, and everyone has the capability to vote for projects, whether they are going to be for-profit projects or non-profit projects, to be funded through that system. And it's very interesting that it came out, I think it was like May 2016, it was the token sale for the DAO, but already in June, some people found a way to hack the system. And they were able to exploit a vulnerability of the system and transfer millions of tokens. Um, so that's the thing that um, it was very frustrating for the whole community because on the one hand, code is law means, okay, if it were possible for the hackers to do that, maybe that's what the intention of the code is. So we shouldn't try to change that. But on the other hand, it's actually kind of like a cheating, right? And that's morally wrong for that kind of an organization. So you don't know how to deal with that. So there were a lot of debates, and eventually that was the reason for the big Ethereum fork, right? So the Ethereum Classic was from the guys who said, okay, no, we, we don't want that kind of a change and we want to keep to the code is law imperative and the others basically moved on. So doing that means that th there are two things to consider here. One is, of course, that if it happened once, it might happen in the future. And we actually do know that that was not the only problem with solid smart contracts at that time. And from, from that time until now, so many different other bugs has been found. And if we know something about software, is there will always be uh, bugs and they will be, always be exploited. So keeping that rigidly to a code is law argument is very hard to defend. Yeah, as you know, Hedera tries to take a more flexible model towards the immutability of smart contracts. We can support a model where once a contract is, is written to state, nobody can change it. But we can also support a model where particular keys have the permissions, the authorizations, the potentially M of N authorizations to edit a contract should the situation warrant, where situation warrant is undetermined from Hedera's point of view. It's presumed some you know, off-ledger 
arbitration process, perhaps, or just the devs agreeing that it's appropriate to fix that sort of bug? Yeah, I actually saw a um, presentation by Lehman in Korea, I believe, that went explicit in, into those options, which I didn't know before that presentation. And the idea that from upfront you will be understanding how the key structure works is a great idea because you always will be having the option to do Solidity smart contracts the same way you do it on Ethereum and it won't be changed. But you will also be going to have either one key or a multi-level threshold key concept of changing the code. So you could add kind of a consensus participation for making those changes. And I think that's, that's a great addition to the system. It has also a second benefit. Because we know that code isn't going to be changed on a smart contract, sometimes programmers come up with creative ideas of trying to have some kind of an influence on the system from the external call of functions. We actually call that backdoors. And it's a hacky thing, right? If you're going to create a smart contract for an ICO, then people will demand you to do an audit for that, right? Because if you build backdoors into your system in order to have that flexibility, then Nobody can, could guarantee that you are not going to use that to transfer tokens from A to B without consent of the investors. So there are frameworks like Open Zeppelin that have proven contracts that one can use and build that into the system that one is going to build. And actually, that helps also the auditors to recognize if there are some kind of a backdoors in the system or not. Now, having the option to have a key structure outside of the code gives you the permission to actually write simpler contracts that are more clearly understood by auditors without the need to try to squeeze some kind of a backdoor into your system. And I think that is going to improve smart contracts on Hedera. Yeah, the auditor could focus on on the business logic of the contract and separately and distinctly look at the transparent permissioning as manifested in the keys attached to that smart contract. Exactly. It's a separate check. And they understood the the logic of Hedera, then they could you know, validate the mutability policy, if you will. Yes. It's a great programming practice to make the invisible features more visible, so make the implicits more explicit in programming, so people have a choice to clear, understand, and make decisions. So, so if there are like maybe potential investors for that mentioned ICO that has a key structure, some may say, okay, I'm not interested in that kind of a smart contract, and I move along, and that's fine. But there are others who say, I'm interested in long-term relationship with this organization. So if they are going to have a foresight and are going to think long-term and they are going to explain the way the code is going to change, who is going to participate, how the voting process is going to be, I may actually have more trust in that kind of an organization that is not going to be too rigid, keeping the flag, code is law for PowerPoints. I think that's a good choice to have. Very true. So another way to acknowledge um, or to mitigate the, the challenge of um, bugs in, in code is to not put the code on ledger, to keep the business logic off ledger and yet still take advantage of the trust model of a public ledger. That's the model that we're trying to enable with the new consensus service. In that model, smart contracts, quote unquote, effectively aren't on the ledger. They're somewhere else, but we're still able to tap into the ordering and timestamping and trust model of the bigger public ledger. 
My experience with smart contracts in the last two years and trying to also understand other organizations, smart contracts, or the people I am involved in has been that in most cases, it's either about some kind of a token, either it's a fungible token, yeah, like ERC20 for, let's say, ICOs or some other kind of a, an experiment, or there are some non-fungible tokens like 721. And there are some kind of escrows, deposits, kind of keeping the tokens until some external condition happens. But beyond that, the contracts usually get very complicated because once programmers see an opportunity to write code in a program, they try to add more and more functionalities. Now, if you have a service outside of a smart contract that gives you the possibility to request some kind of a consensus timestamp for its transaction, and you can combine that with a message or, or some encrypted information, then you are going to either not need, in many cases, that complicated smart contract at all, or you may end up with having a very simple smart contract with a very precise idea of a token, for example, that you may need for your system, some higher order token that sits on top of the H bar. And everything else becomes part of your own code running somewhere else. And then you have all the possibilities of using your programming languages of choice, the infrastructure you already have. And let's say you are in an enterprise environment, there are so many requirements for running any code in production. And that would make it a lot easier for the DevOps system administrators, project managers, product owners, and so on to work inside their own environment. And that's actually something I'm looking very forward to because it's going to be a game changer for many companies who aren't interested in having Solidity smart contracts on some Ethereum or Ethereum-like platform. Yeah, we're using AppNet to refer to that off-ledger infrastructure that you know can still tap in via the consensus service into that broader trust model and gain the efficiencies of, of running that complex business logic you described on their own infrastructure, not duplicated across Hedera nodes, but, but you know still get that timestamp and ordering. Ali, uh, thank you very much. This has been great. I can't promise that this recording will be immutable because I think the, the sound engineer will edit, but your key's on it, so you're, you're implicitly authorizing those edits. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening to Hedera Hashgraph's Gossip About Gossip. If you like the episode, please subscribe, rate and review, and also share and tell your friends. Or connect with us on social media like Twitter, Instagram, etc. at Hashgraph. Particularly if you want to leave us feedback on the podcast. We look forward to hearing from you.